Okay, so um, thanks for being here. And we were just talking uh, a few minutes before with Suresh. He was complaining that my name is difficult to pronounce. I have problems to pronounce his name. So please apologize if I say no, name wrongly. So Suresh is coming all the way from Canada. It's good because we, we are, I think it's the first time we have somebody from, coming from all the way to here from Canada to Beacon. So it's good. And he's going to also show us uh, some use case. Um, if you have some use case for the next conference, please submit them. I'm very happy that we had the University of Zaragoza yesterday, <coughs> something from the healthcare system from Spain. Now we have another university. And he's a um, senior developer. He has a very good experience in all this stuff. So when he's saying, I wish I would have done this differently, he's not just talking about his first experience, he's talking about, about all the background that he has. So. Please welcome Suresh Yoshi. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me well? Thank you. Uh, I have a catchy title, actually. I wish I had done this differently, and this is for the reasons that I put it here. And there was a previous two uh, lesson learned uh, best practice here from Luis Cabecera, Alfresco best practice, and Boris, uh, Alfresco worst practice. If I had known that, I didn't have to come here to explain my things, you know. So it's very important to actually go through that best practices and not to follow the worst practices, and you don't have to come to the conference to present your use cases. But I didn't do so, I'm here now. Uh, I have a 15 years of experience with the content management solutions, and I work for University of Alberta, which is in actually Edmonton, Canada. Uh, I joined there since 2013. I'm a developer as well as the operational manager, look after the electronic document record management initiative. It's called EDRMS. And I've been using Alfresco since 2010. I believe it's version 2.2 and then all the way down to now 4 and 5 too. Uh, I'm a certified Alfresco engineer as well as certified EPSERP engineer. I know here a lot of certified engineers might be here, but in Canada it looks Great because they are less. <laughs> so uh, my introduction, uh, this is actually divided into three parts. Well, first part is the introduction, second, and providing with the context of our implementations, and second is the technical part, and third one is the process part. Uh, so we, let's look at the University of Alberta at a glance. It is a top five university in, Cam in Canada. Uh, 39,500 students with the annual budget of 1.26 billion euro and it affects over 335 million and 230,000 alumni worldwide. Uh, I will leave up to you to guess where we are at in the world context, but one of the 2016 ranking we are top 100 among the world. I have seen a lot of demo is done in the conference here. I would like to actually do the real live stage demo. I think nobody has done. Uh, Francisco did try to do some demo, so let's do that. I need some actor. Uh, I will select uh, Boris as one of my actor. And so you don't have to come here, by the way. <laughs> and David is another actor, okay? So Boris decided to actually apply to the University of Alberta. So he had the admission applications, all the transcript, all the information, and he sent to the, because you look at university at a glance, and it's, it's good university, I think I should go and then take my, pursue my further education in computer science. So document come into here, and then once it comes into university, that is pretty much true for most of the university, is go to registrar office and go into the filing cabinet, if the process is paper-centric process, okay? Go into filing cabinet, and what is going to happen is that the, somebody stored there. Now I need to go and to look at that document. I will go into filing cabinet. Same like a library system, we're going to check out here. Saying that, okay, so let's take this document, and I will come back and I will review it. Oh, there is no test score for IRTS or TOEFL, you know, and it can come back. At the same time, David come here and look for the document. He doesn't see the, what he sees, or Suresh is holding that document. He will wait for a couple of days until I finish my work. I will come back again, and here, and David again come back and look at the document, and he will put the IRTS score or TOEFL score there. And Bindu is upstairs in different department, computer science. He need to look at the same document. 
So I will use the internal mail to send him. It will take a couple of days or maybe weeks. He can look at. At the same time, David is updating here document. I'm looking for the document. Did you see how much the document is holding here? Did you see the problem here? So the whole purpose of the EDRMS is that reduce the cost of paper processing, faster response time, and streamline the business process and adherence to the audit and regulatory uh, standard. And we are trying to do this as a university-wide. And I was going to explain why it has to be campus-wide initiative, not the department-wide initiative. So what happened? Uh, initiative started back in 2008. Uh, there were several failed attempts. Is because of not acquiring the right tools, not having the people in process in place, not having the technical resource. Uh, so for the same example, uh, for example, a deep, uh, window of stairs in a, one of the department here, he wants to streamline his business process. He said that, okay, I want to decide everything. I want to streamline the process. He did that. That's great. So what is going to happen is that the, once he reviewed his document with all the digitization, everybody look into the computer and the document management systems and find, they were going to send back document to the registrar office again. I'm not digitized. I need a paper. So what I will do, I will need a paper. So they will going to send back the paper. I will put some sticky note again. Something is missing. Some file is missing. Some info is not clear. I will going to again send back to the that department. Again, look, they already digitized this document. Now again, they need to digitize. So only implementation with the department is specific might not provide a lot of value. So this initiative has to be the campus-wide initiative throughout the, uh, based on the record series. So that's why we started doing as a record series. Rather than the department's implementation, we try to use as a record series. So, so where we are now, we are the first Canadian university to implement all freshman campus-wide ECM solution there. So I need a help from all freshman because we are first in Canada. So you guys need to help us, you know, to make it more successful. Uh, and based on our university profile, I think it's always good to, all freshman to actually help us because it's given name to the all freshman itself, the university using, you know. So, Currently, we have a three record stream in Alfresco, uh, admission document, uh, donor document, and the graduate student documents. We have a 700,000 document in the repository, uh, Alfresco 5.03 and Episoft. A growth of 20,000 document monthly. Among them, 10,000 is actually scanned document close to, and sorts were performed 55,000 times. What that means is people actually came to your and looking for document that many times. Maybe they have done more, but imagine how much time does it take to come and then look for the document, when the document available in the document management system, and they can perform it, and they can actually perform work parallelly. So in this case, David, myself, and Bindu can actually work at the same document at the same time. So there is a tremendous uh, streamlining opportunity for streamlining the business processes. So where are we heading? Uh, like I say, we want to implement as a campus-wide initiative rather than department-specific. Uh, so we are prioritizing our ECM implementation based on return investment, process implement, uh, improvement, and the compliance. And I'm also working on Alfresco 5.1 upgrade, not the 5.2, by the way, and the record management system. And I would like to actually uh, mention that David here. I have lot of conversation with him and he's so helpful actually providing the information on this sector. I really appreciate that. Thanks, David. So let's dive into the technical one. And this is more relevant with uh, what the Boris and the Luis has uh, provided as a best practices. So update all fresco regularly. We learned this very, very hard way. What happened is that uh, back in 2000, well, in 13, we installed Alfresco 4.1.4 versions, and 2014 and beginning of 2015, we bring the two record series uh, into the uh, our document Alfresco. And then what happened is that the, you see the all that red bar error is a famous red bar error. Uh, then other one is a 500 errors. People users are seeing like a thousand of these errors, and 
shortest thing in 35 seconds. Imagine somebody waiting for 35 seconds and seeing this error, how frustrated they would be. And it's a decreased confidence in the software. And we already have a failed attempt previously not occurring the right tool. We had in the process of parts of actually collapse of the whole EDRF initiative. And we contacted the Alfresco Consulting, and then they come here uh, to our, uh, they look at the, uh, everything they call the Alfresco HealthSec, and they said that, okay, you are running into the Alfresco bug in 4.1.4, you have to operate into 4.1.10. The next day I operate, no error at all. So I spent so much time, it's so frustrating for the user as well as the developer myself hunting down what has caused the issue. So I learned that very, very, very hard way. So my lesson is here, upgrade or upgrade Alfresco regularly, please. I know there's a lot of work behind the scene it involves the upgrade. You might need to find the right time, but always keep in mind that you have to update or upgrade the Alfresco. So from my experience, when is the best time to do it? If you are bringing the new business unit or business department, then try to do the upgrade and bring them to the new environment so that they don't have to suffer like us. So be on a supported platform. You might be thinking, why you guys are not the supported platform? You have to think as a university or organization who has a 300 staff. VM is managed by one team, database is managed by other team, and system administrator, and we manage the Alfresco. So there might be some issues, some vulnerability, security vulnerability going on. They have to upgrade the database. They have to upgrade the OS. So it is very hard to sync everything. So you might be going into the unsupported platform very, very easily. But what is going to happen? If you are enterprise Alfresco license holder, if you call the Alfresco support, or if you read the ticket, they ask you, JMX term, log platform. First answer they gave you, you are not in supported platform, we can help you out. You are left alone in that situation. So it's very important to, I understand their point too, but sometimes I feel like, oh my God, this is not related with the database. I know, I know where the error is coming from. I know the line of code where the Java is throwing that error, but no, no help. Even though if you go into the online tool also, and online support also you won't get. And what we notice, even though your supported platform can save and then even the minor version. So you have to always keep eyes on the support plan. It's very, very important if you want to get the officer support or community help. Focus on objective and not on the tool. Correct tools and technology might not be the answer. And mask the tools and technology and create a business case. So I would like to give an example one for this. Um, we have a typical ECM solution business brought into scanning the document and put the document into the repository, okay, that's good. And we look at the tool, and we had a couple of tools. We bought the scanner. The scanner come with the scanning software, boom. And then we have a tool to actually add the metadata, and we try to use that. And we, we have the office of sub, if it's sub, sub too. And if it's have a nice uh, interface where you can actually validate the, all the metadata, and we try to use that, and also, you see the four tool is coming into effect here. The reason why we do that, we have to save the money because we don't we don't want to purchase any tools. We boom, we went to the live and business not happy. Because it's problematic because if somebody is taking so long to process the document and if it's is great, I'm a certified if you I love that product, but if you are not nothing to extract there, it doesn't provide much of the value. And if there is a fail in the document in the process, and you have to look for the four places where it can go. Business not happy. Then what we did? Okay. We need to make a business case here. We need the right tools here. So we convinced, to, convinced the management saying that, the, okay, we bought the uh, Cofax and if we saw, uh, the Cofax and the scanner go well together, and after that, and if, what the Cofax was, they use the metadata and go to Alfresco. So it reduced into two from the four. Business is happy. So always try to look for the objective, not on the tools. Do not try to reuse the tools what you have. You need to match with the objective. So this is this is we learned from our implementation. Log, log, log. As a developer, I don't have to mention you how important the log is. It has saved a tons of my times, probably it will it has saved the many other times. 
The thing is that the way to log and when to log, based on our experience, every entry and exit point of the document, if it's coming from the scanner, going into staging area, just before coming to staging area and leaving the staging area, going into the right folder before and after that. The reason why important, your script worked fine, but user might move that document back into the staging and you have no idea how the document landed here. And then you look at, okay, and user doesn't see that, okay, document didn't move, it's supposed to move. There's a problem in the one. So in that case, it will help you a lot to figure out. And once you log, you have to make use of those logs. We use this form, and you see the right hand side, the report. This, we send daily report to the user saying the, how many transcripts we process that day. And then there are a lot of reports like that. The business will verify, okay, if, then if something doesn't match, they will trigger to us. Then we do the investigation that way, do the validation too. And since we are logging so much, you have to uh, worry about actually overflowing the log space. We have done that log partitions and all fresco act very differently in that situation. And you will be surprised how the log will be used. And this is the one of the log that I created for entry and exit. In Alfresco 4.1, you don't have a, like a faceted sort or anything like that to get you the fancy output. And business has passed that files in number of to try to get how many document type in the system, when did we receive. So always log sufficient information so that it can be used in the future. So simplify the architecture. This is also important. Uh, reduce the number of uh, variables that might impact your Alfresco implementations. Uh, do the cost benefit analysis before introducing new tools. Why this is important? I would like to give you the example on the right hand side. This is our new upgraded in our architecture. Uh, the PG pool is there and this is new to us. We didn't have a PG pool before and we, we love the tools, you know, like a developer or a system admin. Oh, this is cool to let's use it, you know, oh my god. But think about that. What value does it provide? Do you really need that tool? We didn't have any database incident. We didn't have any database problem, anything like that. And why do we really need that? After doing the cost benefit analysis, we said, okay, let's remove that tool. So this is very important to look at. Because as soon as I put that PG pool, somebody has to learn that. And if it's a new tool, if you don't have internal resource, now we are actually learning the cluster FS. After I went live back in October, I have a four incident. Among the four incidents, three incidents related with the cluster FS. Now we are hunting the information. Okay, oh, this is go to online. What's happening? Go to online. So always think before introducing the new technology there. And Alfres is great open source product, so they use a lot of other open source technology. You need to make aware yourself about that. Otherwise, you'll be run into a problem where you don't know how to fix it. And use the moni monitoring tool, and we do a lot of monitoring in our system too. There are other, there are other aspects also that I would like to uh, hear. Uh, one thing, uh, what we found very important is for example, if you call someone and if signal is dropped, how frustrated you are. Yes, you will be. The same thing, if you are going through the web app or whatever the connection point you have, make sure that's so stable. If you think it's not stable, don't deploy the solution at all. User gonna complain you. You have to face that issue later on. So always make sure that connection point is very, very strong. And why the name is space collision, I'm actually working with Devin now. I run into that issue. I define the record management Alberta as the RMA. RMA is actually the result prefix for the record management here. So I'm in trouble. So always try then what I found maybe useful is maybe use the prefix before. So if I have used the UA, then I could have avoided that. So that's very important. And about the product structure and the naming convention. Uh, you have to involve the actual user who go into the system, look into the system. They will know what need to be put there. The process, knowledge. And how many of you here actually uh, work with the uh, external consulting company? So you actually hire the external consulting company to do your work? Okay, okay, you are the only one. Okay. So this is very important uh, because the, the university or organ, 
government organization, they will get one set of money and then you go and deploy the things. After some time you run out the money, then you don't have the people to actually help you out. So it's very important to build the learning plan as a part of your project delivery so that you want, so you always get, have a knowledge on how the system working and always build the AMP and deploy internally. I was surprised how many dependencies were there first when I get the code from the contractor and then try to compile it, you know, and then build the AMP. How the software code inside, this is also very important because you can see the what they have been sent over the history that can build your knowledge over the time. And consider the intellectual property. This is very important. What will then happen is that the, you ask them to develop the code and that's they might use the utility functions, which is part of the another uh, that has been already created in the contractor, and they will use it, and then you go back again and say, I need that, no? I can't give you because you didn't pay for that. Then you are off the hook again, you know, so you have to actually define your IP right and that kind of things, who wants, and how the update can kind of propagate it to your software code. So change manual process, where the as a developer, where we are lacking is actually human aspect of the change. We are really good on the system level change. I can fix the bug, I will go deploy it, everything looks fine, but we often miss the human aspect. It's, human aspect is as important as the system level change. Always keep in mind, you have to look from the lens from the user point of view. How the change will impact the user, not the system. So this is very, very important. Provide the employee training with happy focus on the people. Communicate the message behind why this change is needed. Involve the user in testing. This is also another very, very important part. I have done many times and I have prepped many times too. So, because I thought, oh, this is nothing. But I didn't go into that fringe cases that the user, business user is actually used to and are seeing the thing. I would like to give you one example. If you have, if you look into Alfred's to share on the left hand side, then the document tree. And if you have a folder more than 2,000, that's as a part of the Alfresco best practice, you should not have more than 2,000, but we have a more than 2,000. I need to fix that anyway. So what is happening is that is throwing the time out. I look at the log and I see the bunch of time out. Oh, I need to fix this. And then the config actually, you can limit to 100 and whatever you want. I fix it 100. I communicate the business and the people saying that the, I see the bunch of time out. Uh, I will gonna limit to 100. And business say, okay, that's fine because you have to fix something in the system. What didn't I communicate is how this gonna impact you because they are doing the copy and move kind of thing. Now they won't able to see more than 100. Then there's a problem there. What I should have done? I should have speak to their language. You know, like. A, I'm making a hundred, now this is gonna impact you because you don't see the more than hundred there, now you need to build the process. Ultimately what they did, they start putting the funny character in front so they can appear on the on the top of the list so they can move it, but that, that change didn't go quite well because I didn't look after the human aspect of the change because I was only focusing the system level of change. So it's very important to actually look through the user point of view why the change is needed. Other aspect to consider, establishing the funding model. Um, this is very important for the sustainability of the project because you get the one influx of the money you deploy, then you don't know what you're gonna do up the next time. So, and establish the proper government structure and we do steering for the uh, direction, strategy, and change advisory for, for our managing the day-to-day uh, -day operations. Build a small but think bigger. There is a reason why we wrote this. The university or government are like us. They try to build everything at once because they have a lots of money. Sometimes they get as a part of project, and then they don't try deadline. They forget to incorporate the user input again. You have to redo it again, again. So that's gonna happen. So you have to be very careful on that side. I think I cover the most of the things here. Thank you. So we have time for questions. So who wants to ask a question? I have plenty, so but I will let you uh, ask questions first if you have. I don't want to monopolize the questions. Okay. Ah, okay. Let me first get to that. 
So during the new process implementation, so do you involve users also like collecting the requirements, giving the feedback yeah. or getting yeah. the feedback from that? Uh, it's actually coming from the business user. Okay, so in that case, how you are failing when, when you are making a small changes, like you said you have limited the folders structure. Yeah, in, in that case, the change is not coming from the business. It's coming from the log analysis. So I initiate the change because I see there's a timeout. Okay, so as a developer, you fix it. Oh yeah, because I have to look at the thing, how the system performing, <coughs> and you have to make the changes, what is needed. But what I didn't do is communicate from the business language. I communicate from the system level language, there's a timeout, I need to fix it. Oh, yes. Hello, very nice presentation, I must uh, say. Uh, case studies are always a uh, very, very good uh, point. Uh, how many users are using uh, the Alfresco we have installment uh, yeah. at the moment? And maybe uh, just a uh, um, rough estimation of the total cost of ownership, meaning uh, how much, uh, how much uh, the percentage at least money did you invest in uh, adjustments and the uh, development of the, these business processes? And, uh, Subscriptions and the maintenance. Uh, which part uh, do you do you do by yourself, and for which part did you use the external uh, help? So, in terms of user, we have about 500 users currently using. Uh, but in terms of active user, I would say close to 200, close to users that are active. Uh, regarding the what we do internally. Initially, it was all contracted. Now, everything is in-house, so we don't contract at all. But we often contract the Alfresco if we run into some of the issues. And we have involved recently as a part of Upgrade 2. And we did, did the upgrade. Mike Priest helped us actually doing the upgrade initially and his company. So for the bigger part of the work, we do. But day-to-day -day maintenance and that kind of things, we normally don't involve unless it has to. So we do our in terms of the licensee and other things, uh, we have a five years license we bought back in 2012. I know Alfred Stats in the licensing, I need to talk with uh, what kind of licensing model we go into because we had a CPU base before. Now it's a user base, so we have to work with Alfresco on that side. In terms of budget and other things, I don't know much of the information. I don't look after the project side, sorry. Um, so, now that you guys are moving campus-wide, yeah. in order to get a sustainable change across the campus, how are you having the different faculties communicate into a single direction? Yeah, it's, that's actually the challenge uh, that we are facing currently. And uh, if you look at the university environment, uh, each, and, each, each and every dean has its own power, so you have to communicate through. So. That's still going to be a challenge to us. We are actually dealing with that challenge currently. So uh, what we are doing is uh, we have a uh, like a steering process. Uh, go to steering, raise our issue, saying that the provide the directions how we can do that, and uh, making sure that uh, everybody aware about our initiative and onboarding process. That's one of the things I say. Define your funding model. So it's so important to onboard the other faculty or other business as you move along. So it has to be. Different. I know it's big, but I can talk to you later. <laughs> so, thank you for coming and presenting that use case. That's great to see. Have you got any processes in place around user onboarding and how to use the system? Yes. We have a, what we do is a, as part of the project, uh, we actually we have a lab and we bring the user into the lab and then go through the extensive training, whatever need to be done. And after that, we have uh, frequently asked questions and knowledge-based article. That's the process actually we follow for the user training. I know it's still lagging, but we are making a progress. And if anybody has the issue, then we're gonna give a call saying that, okay, this is what it need to be, and you know, this is what happened. So improvement is still need to be done, but it's still some process in place. <coughs> Thank you.
Do you have other questions? I hear. So do you have any process in, uh, in place for the build and automation testing or any continuous build kind of stuff in your case? Not really. Not really. Not really. We are working on that. Oh, thanks. Somebody else? Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about uh, user testing that you, you mentioned that was really important. How did or how do you get uh, business to really give you the best testers? Because I had sometimes really bad experience with users that were supposed to test, but at the end uh, they covered maybe 10% of the use cases and they were not um, responsible or empowered to, to really do testing or given responsibility to do testing. So how do you manage it? So what we normally do is, uh, as part of requirement gathering, uh, we talk with the SME, we call the subject matter expert, and we actually testing is done by the both by SME and by us. So I know that, like you said, there are some people who might not cover everything. So we try to write down the what need to be done from our part based on the conversation, and they will also develop the test cases. If we feel like there is no coverage, then we can supplement with whatever we have to do. As a developer, you know when you implement something, you know what needs to be tested. So we try to do, and then we're gonna refer back to the user saying that looks like this test case is missing. Can you please add those cases? You know? So it's an iterative process. Somebody else? Yeah, I have questions. So. Um, for the Gloucester Fest part, uh, what is your decision? Because the last two issues that I have, they were all in April, there was Gloucester Fest. Yeah. And uh, I decided we had a, we had like nine instances that were going to migrate to Gloucester Fest. We did it with two. The two started having problems, so we stopped the, the project. And so any alternative to Gloucester Fest that you're evaluating? Just, are you so just kicking it out or what? Actually, we don't know the root causes. And one for the one cases, we know the root causes is actually the uh, there is some sort of memory error, then you have to upgrade into the next version. Uh, 3.7 I think we have, and I need to check with the exact version. So upgrade would have helped. Other one is actually one of the node in the, what is happening is there is a two node, one node can ping to the other one, other node can get, it doesn't get into the other one. So, and both say I'm alive, you know, so we don't know what is that cause is at. We are still investigating. And for the PG pool, we also had PG pool before, and we also no, we didn't have a PG pool. Before. And finally, we put PG bounce, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. So, um, anybody else has uh, questions? No, I think we had a very good session for, for questions and very interesting. So, as I said, we want more use cases in the conference. So, please, thank you very much.